Um, the usual thing that you want to do with Anemone is that you want to speed it up. So now these um, repetitions, uh, 500 repetitions, it takes uh, some time. So we can, uh, wait, clock, uh, does it work here? I don't know, stopwatch, yeah. So let's uh, start a stopwatch and let's check how long does it take to to actually execute the 500 iterations on my computer. So I will uh, double click here and start the stopwatch here. Uh, this is not precise, but just to have some rough estimation, how long does it take? Still not done. Mm, still not done. Okay, roughly 24 seconds. So uh, this might be too long because this is still a super simple logic here, but still it takes some time to, to uh, execute. Uh, therefore, Mateusz made uh, uh, another version of Anemone, which is called uh, a fast loop um, couple. So you've got fast loop start, fast loop end. They are not compatible with the uh, slow loops. Uh, so this is the fast loop, uh, but basically they, they do the same except it doesn't show in the viewport. So this is being executed silently and then you've got the result in the viewport. So um, I will, instead of uh, modifying the existing thing, I will just create the new, uh, the new one, the, the new copy. I will uh, freeze this, um, delete this, and I will replace the original slow loop with the fast loop. This is what I usually do. I already, I prototype always with the slow loop because I can see the process. And then if everything works, I use the fast loop, but actually I don't use the fast loop too often because, um, because for me, it doesn't work all the time. So I will plug this here, this here. I'm just replacing uh, whatever, oh, sorry. I'm just replacing uh, the wires from the slow loop, I'm plugging it to the fast loop, like this, and uh, this would be the output uh, in uh, data, like that. So I can remove the slow loop components and um, like that. More. And now let's see How long does it take to execute 500 iterations? I will double click to execute. Um, and I need to record data, of course. So double click. No, it's instant. I mean, it doesn't take any time whatsoever. It's, it's instantaneous. So um, sometimes it, it's a huge improvement. So instead of 24 seconds, it's immediate. There's no waiting. Um, and sometimes it doesn't really help uh, to use the, the fast loop and sometimes the fast loop doesn't really work well for me. Um, mostly uh, when inside of the loop, uh, when you are referring to something that is not inside of the loop. So if I, if I plug in, I don't know what this is, but if I plug something like this here, um, usually for me, the, the fast loop doesn't work well. Uh, but I don't know actually the rule. Uh, why is it like that? Um, I prefer using the slow loop. So uh, the question about uh, slowing down was for an animation. And yeah, as I, as I told, the, the, my, my method, my strategy didn't really work. So I decided to do it different. Uh, so, so um, well, I don't have an answer how to slow it down, but I will show you how to make an animation out of that later on. Um, you can, in Grasshopper, you can make an animation by animating a slider. Uh, let me show you. You can animate a slider. Uh, but this is a completely different way of animating things. And I'm not going into that. Uh, I, I never use it. And also I've got a better uh, option for you. So I will show you the better option. I will uh, double check Facebook if everything works there. It feels like I can sometimes hear myself, which means uh, that maybe it's playing somewhere in one of the tabs here, but no, it's okay. Uh, all right, back to, back to the tutorial. Um, this session was supposed to be called vanilla with uh, sprinkles of top, uh, on top. Um, when, you, when you talk about vanilla uh, programming language, it means that you're using it 
without any plugins or add-ons or libraries. And um, this is sometimes a good strategy because um, uh, the language itself, like the, the, the big, um, the base is usually well done. It's usually, um, uh, there is a quality control. There is a team who is working on that language and um, they make sure that everything works well and it's uh, systematic or there is a s systematic approach to, to the language. So everything works within certain logic. Um, this is not always the case for Grasshopper, mainly because it's mostly one uh, one man show. It's uh, it's mostly done by David Rat uh, David Rutten himself. Uh, I don't know if still, but for a long time he was the the only and sole uh, developer of Grasshopper, which is an impressive approach. This is something that um, I think this is unprecedented that he himself uh, did something this huge, um, and mostly he's very very strict about. Um, uh, the choice of the components and they are they are coming from the same system or at least what I'm using the subset of, of uh, components that I'm using is uh, um, just uh, very uh, basic and they all work in the same in the same way um, this is not entirely true like it's not entirely true that everything works well in Grasshopper there are still bugs uh, for example some of the components now can uh, calculate the stuff in parallel, so they are faster because you can use all the cores of your computer. Uh, so if you've got a four core computer, uh, then it's four times faster. Um, but sometimes uh, it's buggy, uh, mainly because it, it uh, shuffles the, the results, which is, uh, which is a wrong behavior. But mostly, in most cases, you can, it, it is reliable to say that, um, when you are using just pure stuff from uh, from the programming language, everything should work well uh, and within the same system. Um, you you don't have that. Uh, you cannot be sure about that when you're using any libraries. And this doesn't only apply for for um, Grasshopper, but that apl applies to any programming language. Um, this is uh, usually the case in in JavaScript, where you have a library for everything, uh, but you never know how how is it how is it made. And for me, it's very important to understand how things work before I start using them or when I'm using them, because only then I know how, what are the boundaries and what are the possibilities. And if, I, if it's not easy to, to backtrace, if I cannot really see that, then it's a very, um, it can be very confusing. And you see that I've got a lot of plugins installed, but I don't really use many of them. Uh, I, I have them because um, sometimes I need to open uh, a definition uh, made by somebody else and I need to have the, the plugin installed so that I'm compatible. Uh, but I only use a few of them. But before I do, I will show you one library that you will never ever need. Uh, a library that exists and it's, it's a completely unnecessary uh, nonsense. And it's, a, it's called a Boyd library and it's made by myself. Uh, so this is a library that I made because I thought it's a good idea, but now I think it, it was a completely bad idea to, to do it and I'm not promoting it anymore because I think what people shouldn't be really using it so much. Um, uh, the whole uh, iterative um, tutorials that I made are based on, uh, well, the, the flocking part is based on that. This is something that, uh, these are the tutorials that I gave you yesterday. Uh, and this is something that is kind of popular on our uh, website. And I will show you the basics of the flocking uh, today. And uh, the message is that the logic that I'm explaining, even in the flocking tutorial, the, the logic that I will explain today, that's valid, that's all good. And I'm pretty happy about uh, how I made it. But the plugin itself is completely unnecessary. You can do the same stuff without use, using the plugin. And that's the case for many, many plugins. Um, I just want to explain uh, when do I think that you, you should use a plugin and when it's not necessary to use a plugin. Um, it's always good to use one when it allows you to do something that uh, pure Grasshopper doesn't. For example, some input and output stuff. Um, uh, there is one uh, plugin that is pretty old and it's um, called Firefly and it allows you, for example, to use a webcam. So I don't know if I can really uh, use it here, but uh, because I'm using it for, for the Zoom conference, now it crashed. So you see, it doesn't work, but um, uh, it doesn't work now when I'm streaming. 
uh, it will work uh, some other time. But this is something that there is no way of doing that uh, without having a plugin. So inputs and outputs, of course, you should use plugins. Um, stuff that is not embedded and it's not part of the language, like loops, of course you, you use a plugin using uh, Animon or a hoop snake, it's always a good idea. Um, uh, but that's, you see, it's an input output or it's something that, um, that is not part of the language. But it, if, if it gives you some, some shortcuts to achieve something, um, of course you can use that, but there is a real risk that you will not understand what is the principle behind. And as I told you, when I'm teaching, I'm trying to be thorough and I'm trying to explain in detail what things do and how do they do that. Uh, on the other hand, if you are comfortable with um, with uh, the plugin that allows you a ready-made solution that otherwise you can do in Grasshopper, then go ahead, use it, uh, but always make sure that you understand what is it doing. And sometimes it's just packing some components into one, and sometimes it's just very uh, few components. So uh, let me just show you my Boyd library and why is it completely unnecessary. Um, First of all, what is it good for? It's simulating uh, flocking behavior in Grasshopper, which is something that you wouldn't be able to do without using, for example, Animoon or a hoop snake, because you need to, to uh, process things in time. Uh, this is also done uh, in Kangaroo, and I also believe that in Kangaroo 2, you can also simulate flocking. I've never done it, so I'm not going to show you, but if you, if you, ever, if you have ever done any um, uh, structural simulation, or a catenary surface uh, simulation in Kangaroo, you see that it's being animated somehow. And what it does is that the Kangaroo solver, which is uh, this component, uh, this one, it actually is looping inside. So you're inserting all the, all the things here, like inputs, then there is a loop inside, just like the one with the animal, just way more efficient and then it outputs something. And because this is an engine that calculates um, expectable inputs, you don't really need to see inside of the loop because the, the loop that it's repeating is always the same. It's, it's a physical simulation. So there are ready-made things that do the loops and Kangaroo, again, is one of the things that uh, is very useful to, to have because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do it with vanilla grasshopper but you would be able to do it with uh, Animon. Probably it would just take uh, a, a long time and it probably will be a slow calculation. So again, Kangaroo is something that makes sense, but uh, let me show you what doesn't really make sense to, to be used. Um, so um, I will start uh, I will start uh, a loop and I will show you what my Boyd library is actually doing, uh, my Boyd plugin. So, um, so there is a loop start and loop end, and I will have uh, two, two loop back data. So uh, one data will be uh, a list of points. So I will just um, generate some random points. Uh, this is 100 points. So let's just take uh, 20. Uh, let's make a slider. So count is here. So this is 20 random points. I will put it here. Also, uh, let's make them move in X direction. Oh, uh, this is unit X vector. Let's put it here. And then uh, I want to, I want this, uh, these points to actually move like a flock to, to actually create some, some, uh, shape patterns that, that so that it looks like birds are flying around each other. So uh, that's what the Boyd library is for. Um, this is based on, on um, an algorithm called Boyd. Uh, let me see. So um, just a moment. So it was developed by uh, Craig Reynolds and it basically says that if you want to simulate a flock uh, you just need to have uh, three super simple um, behaviors. So you, you have uh, a lot of a flock of individuals like birds or fish and each one has uh, three behaviors, exactly three behaviors and that's it, you don't need anything more. Um, the first uh, behavior is uh, separation 
So um, each one is trying to keep apart from, from the neighbors, so not to be too close. If you're thinking of birds, you, you, you can imagine that the bird needs to flap the wings and it shouldn't really slap uh, the bird next to it, so it needs to keep some distance from the neighbors. Alignment uh, means that um, each bird in a flock uh, looks around and checks the direction of the other birds flying around and uh, steers so that it's actually uh, aiming the more or less the same direction like the neighbors. And cohesion is uh, the opposite of separation. They basically want to uh, stay together in a, in a pack, just not too close because that's the separation. If you just implement these three behaviors, then the birds are going to, to um, perform the flocking, the, the beautiful shapes that flocking uh, brings. So I basically did the same. Um, the first one is separation. For me, it's called uh, repulsion or repulse, uh, which is in, even in, in English grammar, it's wrong. It should be called um, repel, uh, and I made a mistake here, but I've never changed it. So basically, um, there are some inputs. Uh, the repulsion needs uh, the agent location point. So we already have the points and this has to be done repetitively. That's why I'm doing it in, uh, in a loop. So, so in, in data one, I've got the locations. Um, so uh, then it needs to know the locations of the neighbors, which is here. Uh, and also it, it needs to know a search distance, how far it cares about the uh, the neighbors, I'm not really, uh, well, um, this actually defines uh, the separation, how, how far the, the units should be from one another, the agent, and the multiplier, which actually makes it uh, stronger or uh, weaker, the behavior. At the end, this gives me a motion vector that uh, actually uh, makes sure that for each, uh, the vector shows the direction where each of the agents, each of the points should move so that it's separated from its neighbors. So this is a motion vector that I need to uh, use when I want to move the flock, the, 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 the elements from their current position to a new position. So um, the thing is that um, Right now they are so far apart that they don't need to move at all. Uh, I will change the search distance to something, something more, uh, let's say, I don't know, 10 units uh, maybe. And then, uh, yeah, they already, they have already moved um, from their uh, original position. Now, um, the second was um, uh, adhesion, I think. Um, yeah, alignment, alignment. Um, alignment is here. So again, uh, this component, it needs uh, the current motion vector of, of um, uh, the unit of the, of the agent, uh, the motion vectors of all the other agents, and then it creates a motion vector that uh, aligns the, the current, the, the movement of the current um, agent so that it's more or less the same like all the other neighbors. Right now, they all have the same initial vector. So they all move in the X direction. This is not something that I want. At the beginning, I want them to move randomly. So there is a component uh, that's called a uh, random vector. And uh, I can generate 20 uh, uh, random vector vectors like this. So now every um, agent at the beginning wants to move in a different direction, but this uh, aligns them. So if I move the, the agents according to this motion vector, it, they basically start uh, to move more or less uh, in the same direction. Um, it's just strange that, yeah, it's somehow aligned. Okay, uh, but I want to apply both of these. And actually there is the third one, which is um, uh, called cohesion. Uh, and that one actually means that they want to stay together. So this component calculates a vector uh, that the, the, the agent needs to take to actually come close to, uh, to the rest of the flock. So that requires the agent location, uh, the location of all the other agents in the, in the flock and a search distance, uh, which doesn't really matter. Now it takes all the, all the elements from the flock. Let me make it a little bit more visible. 
So because this uh, popular 3D also creates the box, I just want to have the points there. Okay. Now, if I move them uh, according to this one, uh, then um, they are slowly moved uh, a little bit to, to the center of the flock. Now I've got three behaviors here. Uh, I can, and they are actually vectors. So they generate vectors and I need to move the, the flock according to the vectors to actually come to, to actually achieve the, what, what I want. So um, instead of just applying them one by one, I will, um, sum the vectors, I will add the vectors one to another, which in vector math, it actually generates uh, a vector that points all the directions, like, like um, it finds the average of these uh, three vectors. I will apply it as a motion and you will see that, that the new position of the flock is here. Um, so this is the new position of the flock. I will plug it here. This is the new uh, vector. I will plug it here. And when I start animating this now, it should actually look something like a flock. Uh, but let's see, maybe I will have to do some adjustments. So now I repeat it and you see that they are moving somehow and I can uh, record the data so that we actually see how does it, how does it look. You see it's moving somehow and it looks like a, a flock is doing something. The problem is that it slows down after a while because there is nothing uh, driving it anymore. So now it's in some sort of an equilibrium. Um, what I can do is I can uh, make the separation even bigger um, or maybe the, the uh, cohesion could be uh, stronger. Um, there is a multiplier here that actually tells me how strong each of the behaviors should eventually be. So let's make the cohesion, which I call uh, uh, adhe adhesion here. Uh, let's make it stronger by default it's 0 0.1. And it's basically just a multiplier for the vector. So let's make it uh, 0 0.2 so that it's stronger. When I restart, uh, you see that they are they kind of want to uh, come together uh, quite strongly and then they are in some sort of um, equilibrium. Uh, there are other components here, uh, for example, uh, that they should follow some curve. So I can draw a curve uh, like this. So this is the curve. I will uh, reference it here, set one curve. And uh, there is a component that actually uh, cal calculates a vector for uh, the, the agents to slide along the curve. So it requires an agent location, agent motion vector, reference geometry, which is this, search distance, which is by default, uh, I think, uh, uh, infinite, and a multiplier. So I will add one more behavior to, to the behavioral vectors and let's restart and probably it will somehow follow well, that was, oh, that's strange because yeah, there is a beginning and the end of, of the curve. So I will just place it here. So I will restart and it, yeah, it follows the curve now. And it still does the flocking thing and so on. Uh, also it can revolve around the curve. So again, it needs an agent location point, agent motion vector, reference geometry. Uh, a revolving angle, which is something by uh, something default. I plug it here, restart, and you see that they should be also revolving somehow. We will see better if I draw uh, draw lines instead of points. So I will do a polyline because I'm recording the output. So there are locations of the points here, uh, and I need to um, flip matrix. Uh, I will explain why. So um, the animon is recording um, each time step is one branch uh, in a data tree. And when you, uh, each branch contains a list of, po of points. When you uh, create a polyline, it actually draws a polyline between points in the list uh, from one to another. And, but if you think about the structure that we have here, it means there are 20 points in each branch. So, so the polylines will basically only connect um, the points within one branch. So uh, at the very beginning, uh, what would happen if I connected these points at the beginning, it will just create this. So it will connect the first point with the second and so on. But instead we want to connect historical versions of the same point, which means that the structure uh, that 
has 500 branches and 20 uh, points in each branch, this is not a good structure. Instead, we need to have 20 branches, one branch for each point, and it should contain 500 versions of the same point. Uh, for that, we just need to flip the matrix, which is basically, if you look, uh, if you think about an Excel spreadsheet, you just rotate it 90 degrees. What, what was uh, a row is a column now, and what was a column is a row now. So now we have a um, different structure. We've got 20, um, 21 branches. In each one, there is 500 um, and one uh, point. And when I hide everything and only uh, keep the result, you see that these are some paths that um, the flock made. And I will just, uh, just make this much bigger. I will make the curve way bigger so that um, it doesn't run away so fast. Uh, another thing is that it runs away so fast because um, if you think what we are doing is that we are basically adding uh, some vectors uh, to one to another. So uh, the final vector is as long as a sum of these. So in each iteration, uh, the, the agents are speeding up because they are also using uh, the original um, speed of the well, actually there is no drift. I, will, I can actually add a drift here. So I will add to an existing motion vector. I will add the new motion vectors that I calculated. Now there will be some drift or inertia. So now it will not uh, steer so fast, just like when you've got a boat on, on a lake, you cannot, uh, what, you're, you're floating one direction and you cannot just stop and change uh, immediately. It actually takes some time and it, there is an inertia. So this is what the inertia does. But if you think about it now, this vector is going to get bigger and bigger. So it's going to speed up much uh, faster and faster in each iteration. And there is a component that uh, trims the vector. So basically it, when it's too long, it just chops it off, keeps the, uh, the direction, just makes it, makes it shorter, which means it makes sure that it moves slower. So the length domain should be uh, probably, let's say that uh, we want the vector to be maximum one unit long and not longer. And this will be the, the vector that I calculated. Now let's restart and let's see what does it do. And it looks much nicer. Now it's rotating, it's doing something uh, one with another. And uh, it's also revolving around the, the uh, leading curve. It's revolving around itself. So you see the behavior actually right now is pretty nice. I will save this because I kind of like it. So this is um, uh, day two, day two, file zero one. All right, so the logic, I think it's really good. I really like the result. We, this is the way uh, the jewelry is made. Uh, this is the way we uh, made a lot of other projects as well. So um, I think that's, at, at, at this point, this is fine. Uh, the logic is okay. The thing is that you don't need my Boyd plugin to achieve this, the very same thing. Mainly because if you think about what these uh, components are doing, it's something that you can very easily do with Vanilla Grasshopper. And actually, this is version two of my Boyd library. And with ver version one, um, I actually just made uh, a cluster of uh, Grasshopper components. This is uh, written in C Sharp, but uh, the original one was not. Uh, the original one was just, just packing gr existing Grasshopper components. Uh, this might be slightly faster. This might give you some like, um, a nicer overview of what you are doing, but still you would be able to do it yourself. And uh, actually what I'm doing now when I'm, when I'm simulating some sort of flocking like this, I prefer not using my own components. I prefer just, just making custom components uh, or custom uh, vanilla stuff in, in Grasshopper because I've got a better control over what's happening. So let me sh just show you some, not all of them. So there is random vector, which is super useful. But at the same time, you don't need it. If you open the, the file from yesterday, you can make a random vector easily like this. So it's, it's more components, but you know exactly what is happening. So, so I say it's from minus one to one. So I will generate uh, three numbers uh, like this. There is a random seed. I also have a random seed here. Uh, and then you can, uh, take these three items like this, one, two, three, and then uh, make a vector, uh, which is this one. 
one, two, three. And this is doing exactly what this is doing, except it only generates one. So you can, you can generate more of these vectors um, by just uh, adding more seeds. So um, I will just make um, 20, 20 seeds here. Now there is a data tree and here I've got 20 random vectors. Uh, and if I flatten like this, um, like this, then this is completely exactly the same like what this component is doing. I know that this is longer. I know that it's easier to use this one, but here you have a perfect control over what is happening and also perfect overview. You, you've got a better understanding what you can do. Um, so if I plug this here, uh, the result should be exactly the same. Um, maybe maybe just the, the, the initial randomness is different than, than it was before because the, the logic here is different, but uh, still, it's more or less the same thing. Uh, I will restart like this and it does something, yeah. Okay, so um, the same applies, uh, applies to these. Uh, let me speak about this uh, trim vector. Uh, this is also a super simple logic. So if a vector is longer than something, it, it just chops it. So I can take this one and I can say the, the length of the vector, um, vector length. If this vector length is larger than, if this vector length is larger than one, <coughs> then unit, uh, unit vector, uh, no, how is it called? Yeah, it's called unit vector. I, I made a typo. So, uh, no, it's this vector. So if this is true, then pick this one, otherwise pick the original one. So this is basically trimming the vector and I can just do it by um, uh, uh, stream filters, filter gate, oh, how's that called? Uh, this patch filter, it's called filter. Where is it? Um, stream filter. So if this is true, then if this is true, then uh, use the trimmed one. Otherwise use the other one. Uh, what is the problem? Ah, uh, I should here, I should use pick and choose. Yeah, because I've got more. So. So this is the pattern for those that are larger use the trimmed one for those that are not larger use the original one and the result should be exactly the same. So uh, let's see if, if, if I'm right. So this is what comes out of my component. This is what comes out of here. Like this. Yeah, the values are exactly the same. So I know that this is more components uh, than just, just one, but it's only four. And the thing is, where would you stop? Uh, and we, we, could, we could do the same uh, about these as well. So where would you stop? Where would you des decide that, okay, um, I can pack also this one as a component and, and use it. Uh, but well, if you, if you think about it, you can, you can pack this as a component and it will always generate uh, this sort of a flock. And then another, piece of logic. So I think that it's, if you, if you are able to, I think it's always better to use uh, vanilla stuff, to use just pure grasshopper or pure whatever programming language that you are using to have a perfect control over what you are doing. Also for, for troubleshooting, if there are bugs, also for, for um, uh, some, some um, uh, aesthetical or, or authorship purposes, if you really want to author your thing uh, properly and to understand and to, to, to make it the, exactly the way you want, uh, you need to be as granular, uh, granular as, as you can. You need to divide, split the, the problem into, into smaller problems as much as you can. This is, uh, this is what I think. Um, but also, I'm not really sure if, uh, if this is the case uh, for, for everyone. I also, I, I also know that not everybody uh, would agree with me. And this is something that I would like to discuss with Mike uh, in the afternoon with Mike Pryor. 
and we'll see what what is your take on this uh, what is your understanding of um, of using using plugins um, but this is what 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 I prefer doing um, now instead of just just uh, trashing my own plugin uh, which you can use and and the result will be nice but also if one once you really start understanding the logic you can you can uh, do the same stuff yourself without using the plugin um, but you will still need uh, the anemone um, now I would like to show you a couple of plugins that I I think are essential and you need to to use them so that's the sprinkles on top of, of vanilla that I'm always using. But before I continue, are there any questions? Okay, probably not. But if they are, uh, just, just let me know. I'm also checking the Facebook uh, stream. So uh, just make a comment uh, on the Facebook stream and I will see that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me now show you a couple of plugins that I, I find, find completely essential. So you see that uh, one of them is Anemone. <clears throat> it's super helpful uh, for two reasons. There are some things that you, if you want to make an iterative design, you need to have either uh, Anemone or, or Hoopsnake for loops. But also sometimes uh, the geometry is so heavy that if you use the embedded uh, grasshopper logic, then that you actually process everything at once. That was the circles that I was showing you on the surface yesterday. Sometimes it, it is so heavy that the computer cannot actually handle it. So sometimes it's better to split it into smaller parts, just like with the chairs that, um, just like with the tables that we were doing uh, here. So also it would be possible to generate them all at once like all, uh, all uh, 5,500 at once and pick the correct ones. Um, but uh, that would be so demanding on the computer that we decided to do it one by one, uh, which took more time, but at least the computer didn't crash. Uh, so, so that's one of the reasons uh, why you should use uh, Anemone. That's one of them. The other one is if you really want to make an iterative um, uh, design, just like the, the one exercise that we made yesterday. Um, then there is uh, the input output, just like the Firefly, which allows you to, to read the microphone, read the camera, uh, to read the network, and, and even, even output on the network and so on. This is something that you wouldn't be able to do. Uh, maybe with a Python uh, you would, but still um, that's something. Uh, then there is Kangaroo that uh, I use a lot. Um, uh, the good thing, or Kangaroo 2. Well, actually, I don't use it that much, but, but there are cases w when I do. Um, the thing is that probably you would be able to simulate the same things uh, without Kangaroo, just like I, I was showing you here in this example. Uh, example. But this is such a complex thing. Uh, it, it, it's a full package, uh, and it's well optimized that uh, probably um, it would be uh, a huge waste of effort. And also probably uh, your computer would crash uh, if, you, if you were trying to simulate uh, or do the same stuff without uh, Kangaroo. Because theoretically, you could use Anemone or Hoopsnake to actually make a loop and make the physical simulation, um, uh, which is uh, called a Verlate physics, or probably it's also using different engines as well. Uh, I don't know, it's, uh, you cannot set it up here. I think you could have set it up here. But anyway, uh, there, is, um, there is a logic um, settings. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, there is logic behind how to simulate uh, the physics. And um, in most of the cases using uh, Kangaroo, the built-in stuff is okay because it's well optimized and um, uh, building it up yourself doesn't make much sense unless you want to do something very, very customized then you can use again, use again Anemone instead of, of uh, Kangaroo and just do your stuff instead of uh, Kangaroo, uh, Anemone. Uh, it's in those cases when you really want to see what is happening inside of the loop that runs inside of the, the Kangaroo. Um, so I've got more things here, like uh, there is a V-Ray uh, plugin. We were testing V-Ray uh, recently. And uh, of course, you cannot control V-Ray without having a V-Ray plugin. Um, um, and, and so on. Um, there is a Starlink plugin made by Matos Vyritsky. It was probably the first one he made. I'm not really sure if it's the first one, but it's a very old one. He's not even maintaining it, it, it anymore uh, because also probably the logic behind is not uh, so, uh, so nice anymore, but it does a lot of um, mesh analysis uh, because when he made this, uh, there was no, uh, it, it was difficult to, 
control mesh geometry within Grasshopper because Rhino is uh, not a mesh modeler, it's a NURBS modeler, but sometimes you want to use mesh geometry. So, so Starling was a good uh, plugin for uh, making analysis of mesh, but now you can do it also in, in a different way. Uh, still the mesh tools that are like basic, um, that are um, uh, within uh, Grasshopper and Rhino are way too basic. So uh, you need a plugin for manipulating mesh, which is a weaver bird for me, but I'm only, only using very few components from here. I use the Laplacian smoothing, which is, uh, which is a smoothing algorithm that doesn't uh, add more faces. It doesn't make the geometry heavier. And then um, uh, the Catmull Clark or loop subdivision, which makes it heavier, but even smoother. Uh, and there are some other uh, things it can do for you, like thicken, uh, um, uh, one or uh, two dimensional geometry, like a uh, flat mesh surface, it makes, uh, uh, it adds a volume to it. Um, that's super nice, but that's already something that sometimes I prefer doing uh, manual myself. Um, uh, adding windows or, or just uh, frames, sometimes it's, it's okay to use the, the one, uh, the component from Weaverbird, but sometimes I, again, prefer doing it myself because I've got a better control over uh, the process. And maybe I just don't know how to use these, uh, but I, I haven't used these, uh, I think, before. Maybe, maybe there is a good reason for that. Um, and there is one plugin that I would like to show you that is, um, for me, um, actually, it's made by, by Mateusz Wierzycki as well. He made a lot of plugins. Um, and most of them, I think, are very relevant. Um, but he says that I'm probably the only user of the plugin, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm using it very, very often. Um, this uh, plugin is called a squid. And you can find it on, on Food for Rhino. Um, and squid is uh, just like the, the fish. Uh, it's got ink. And squid is meant for a two-dimensional drawing um, of... Um, yeah, uh, two-dimensional drawing in, in Grasshopper. Uh, and you can export and save the drawings uh, to a file, to a PNG, and you can even s uh, save it to, to uh, a series, uh, a sequence of images, and, and that way you can make an animation. Uh, I will just maybe use this um, simulation that I made. I just think that it's not really so nice. Um, uh, the result that we are having right now is not so nice. So uh, I will just use the original uh, settings. So it's all about the settings at the beginning. So maybe this result will be nicer. Yeah, uh, let's keep this one. Uh, I think it looks okay. I will uh, just um, put into, into a blob uh, those things that I have added, well, what's happening? Remove from group, doesn't work. Probably because we are still looping. So when the loop stops, I'll try to do that. Okay. Uh, remove from group, no, why? Anyway, I'll make group again, good blob. So this is something that I added to show you that you don't need to use my plugin. Uh, also, I will uh, put this into a blob and I will still be using my own plugin. Um, so I will copy paste it again like before and I will show you what the squid can do for you. Um, like that. Good. I will remove the unnecessary stuff from here like this and I will also disable this like this. Okay. So uh, the squid, um, Matus says that um, the squid is actually a programming language within uh, Grasshopper, which is probably true, but um, let me show you what does it do. Um, there is the main squid component, just like uh, Kangaroo has the solver. The, so this is the solver. Um, and there is, um, there is a couple of inputs. The first one is uh, is a rectangle, um, which defines an area that you want to draw. So I will just have a look at this area. I will reference this as a rectangle. Uh, well, you can reference a rectangle, you can reference a curve. Um, um, okay, that's not true. Um, I will always say the whole true, uh, truth. Uh, when you have a rectangle, uh, you can have a, 
parameter that is called a rectangle and you can reference uh, one rectangle and basically it allows you to draw a new virtual rectangle into uh, into Grasshopper. In fact, what happens is that it's somehow internalized. It's just like you, you can internalize data into, into components, um, which makes them part of uh, the Grasshopper definition and you don't need to have them uh, and they are not connected to Rhino at all. So you don't need to have any Rhino file. You can only have a Grasshopper file that contains even the, the geometry. And some of the parameters, which are these components uh, that are only uh, containers for data, some of them, uh, when you uh, when you say set one rectangle uh, or set one point, for example, they actually ask you to um, to to draw the point or to draw the rectangle on the uh, in the viewport, and it internalize, internalizes uh, the, the data. So I'm actually not sure about the point. I think it actually works that way as well. Yeah, I can draw the point. And it's not in in Rhino at all. Or if if it is in Rhino, it's combined actually. So I can I can select it and set one point. And uh, now it's uh, I don't know if it's actually uh, no, it's not part of that. So um, that's why I was not uh, referencing this uh, as a rectangle, but as a curve because with curve it it's not really asking you to draw the curve references the selected curve and the curve uh, just coincidentally is a rectangle so we are lucky so i can uh, convert it into a rectangle and then i can use it as a bitmap this is unnecessary i can do it automatically because the conversion can also happen here so now i convert i i use this curve as a as a boundary of what we are going to draw so if i look at this from above so this is what we are going to draw in the squid so when I double click now the squid, uh, this, is a, this is a view of what squid is actually drawing right now. The squid, uh, the, the quid, uh, knows that this is the boundary, whatever is inside uh, can be drawn, but we still are not drawing anything. Um, to draw something we need to, uh, also an important thing, uh, this exports or can save a bitmap file and the bitmap is going to the resolution of the bitmap will be uh, as big as the units here. So for me, it will be uh, 24, uh, 49 units wide and uh, 57 units tall. Uh, when I say units, I mean pixels. So it's 49 times 57 pixels, which is a super small bitmap. Um, to make it bigger, I can, uh, I can set the pixels per unit ratio and I will say I want to have 10. So now it's 400 by uh, 500 something. 400 something by 500 something. Uh, okay, so but it's still not drawing anything. So um, to draw something, uh, Squid needs a set of instructions what to draw. Um, and the instructions would be this. Um, uh, actually, I will put it inside of that. Um, okay, uh, let's let's go um, step by step. Uh, let's just make it uh, not animated, and then I will animate it. I will not put it inside of the loop because I'm not ready for for that yet. I will be ready uh, later on. Um, for now, I will just draw the final result. Um, and uh, I'll put after the last. So um, no, 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 I haven't done that. So um, I want to draw these polylines. Uh, to draw the polylines, I need to take the draw uh, component here and the draw component uh, doesn't draw immediately. It just uh, generates an instruction for the squid to actually draw something. Um, so um, first I need to know what do I want to draw. It's this uh, set of polylines that I want to draw I will just flatten here because uh, I want to have them in a flat list. So I will add these curves. So I want to draw these curves. Uh, you, you can set the accuracy, which doesn't apply for a polyline. It applies for, uh, for a spline. It actually converts the spline into a polyline, which makes it a little bit choppy, but um, uh, this is the accuracy can make it smoother. Uh, outline, it's a setup for an outline settings. So here I will take the outline, um, component that defines the outline. I can set the color. Uh, let's make them, uh, this is a color swatch. Uh, let's make them, uh, I don't know, 
red for the moment. I can set the width of the line because that's something that you don't do in, in Rhino or Grasshopper, but now we are drawing, so I can set the width. Uh, let's set it to, uh, I think uh, they have to be uh, whole units. So let's set it to two. Uh, that's the outline and I can also set the fill, but these are not uh, closed curves, so there is no fill. So I will put it here and you see that it has drawn them here. Um, it seems like, uh, yeah, one, uh, even one is too much. It's way too thick. So uh, let's um, use um, a real number, um, floating point number. And eventually, yeah, I can, I can make them smoothly. So, so the thickness 0 0.2 looks good to me. They're all red now. And this is a drone bitmap. Um, this doesn't save anywhere yet but I can add another instruction, which is called uh, save file. So, um, so this is an instruction that tells the squid to draw something. Then the, when it's drawn, um, the next instruction should be save it when it's drawn. So I need to specify a folder and a file name and so on. So I will just uh, open the, mm, the folder where I'm saving the stuff here um, like this. Um, I just made a folder. Um, it's, this is the path of the folder. Uh, it will be something different for you. Um, but here, here I am. Um, the file name, I will set the file name um, as SQ01. No, just SQ without 01. And it saves a, uh, and by default, this is a PNG file, uh, which is good because it's, uh, it's a, it has a lossless, uh, uh, compression and it can have a transparent background, which is good. Um, so, so I don't need to say that it should be a TIFF. That that doesn't really uh, is not it's not necessary. And uh, this is the squid instruction to actually save the file. So uh, I will merge the first instruction. So first draw the lines, then save the file. And this is the squid instruction. It has executed already, and I will show you the folder. And in the folder, there is one file called sqpng. When I double click, it opens uh, your previous, well, what? Anyway, so um, I can open it and it looks like this. It's a transparent bitmap uh, with um, um, our PNG file with a lot of lines. So you see it's pixelated. Uh, if I want a higher resolution, I can change this value. Uh, from uh, pixels per unit, I can change it to, let's say uh, 25, uh, like this. So now it has uh, executed because I changed, it a va I changed a value that uh, is an input to, to this one. Uh, now it executed again. And if I look here, now it's uh, the file is um, whatever. Uh, now the file is much smoother and it's also bigger when you look at the resolution now it's 1200 uh, pixels wide um, so that's um, that's how you use animon and now this is also super useful to actually create an animation um, um, i don't want to have 500 repetitions let's just make 100 repetitions um, so now uh, the squid is trying probably to execute all the time and it's actually rewriting the file all the time. Uh, it's the same file whenever uh, there is a new result uh, coming from, uh, from the, um, the loop. It tries to, to draw the, th uh, the thing and save and eventually it's, it, it just uh, saves the file uh, in the same name and, and there is no, um, there is no uh, real sequence of pictures. So I will end up with the last version of the file which is exactly the same as it was as it was before. So this is not very useful as an animation, but you see that uh, this whole thing works quite well. So I will just uh, make a group out of that so that we know that this is something that has to be uh, inside of the loop uh, because we want to draw the versions, the growth of, of the lines. The reason why it has to be inside of the loop is that you can see in my profiler uh, profiler is the uh, thing here that tells you how long does it take to execute each of the components. Uh, you can uh, display your profiler here in um, Canvas Widgets Profiler. Uh, this is pretty slow and because this is really fast, it's actually 
executing or flushing the, the values really fast. This is still not done. And when it's done, um, uh, probably some more uh, changes happened here. So this loop is not waiting for the squid to actually save the things. Uh, to make the squid wait, uh, we need to put it inside of a loop um, and and the loop has to wait until a squid is done. And this is easy to do because uh, there, is a, there is an output value that we actually don't need, uh, but we can, uh, uh, that's used, uh, well, this actually generates a bitmap, which also is um, some uh, squid uh, data that you can use for another squid and so on. So you can have a sequence of squids. So we can use this as a background data for some other uh, squid drawing. But anyway, um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need to. But the thing is that whenever squid is done, it actually um, releases a new version of some data here. And we can use the fact to actually slow down the loop uh, to, to make it wait for a squid to finish. So we just need to add one more uh, loopback data here. Uh, that will wait for squid to, to finish. So, so I will put the, the bitmap there. We don't need the bitmap. We will never use it, just like we are not using this uh, data but we can, we can use it to slow down uh, the loop because when there is still no, no new data, it will not execute the next iteration. So I will take this, put it inside, but we also need to know what are we drawing because right now we only have a, a set of 20 points in each iteration. So the problem is that we are only recording the data here in the loop end. Uh, now we need to somehow record the data inside. So um, instead of, um, Recording the data, I will add one more thing here that will uh, contain also the historical versions of, uh, of the points. Uh, so at the beginning, I will place uh, the original points here and then I will uh, merge. Actually, I need to graft. So I will create a new branch for each point. At the beginning, in each branch, there is one point and after each iteration, I want there to be more and more points. So more and more versions of the point. So I will just merge the original data with the new data. And that also needs to be grafted so that each uh, point falls into its own uh, branch. And we will keep, uh, so this way we will keep 20 branches and they will uh, contain more and more data and each branch represents one point. Basically we are recording the, uh, the historical versions of, of the data. I place it here. So when I, when I run this, um, you, you will see that the D2 will actually contain um, exactly the same points that we need to, uh, to generate the, the polyline. So uh, let me see if that is true. Uh, it seems so. Uh, uh, maybe this is a better view. So I, I expect to have 20 branches. Each one contains 200 uh, and uh, 102 points. That's exactly what I want. Uh, it even visually looks okay. And when I draw a polyline here, then it should look exactly the same as it did before. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I don't want to do it outside. I just want to do it inside. So this contains um, the proper data. And this is something that I want to draw. So I will plug it into the squid. And I want the loop to wait for the squid to, to execute. And I will just um, add one more uh, loopback data only to make uh, the, the animal wait for squid. So now this will actually save each version uh, and wait for, wait for it. Uh, so you see that it's drawing uh, each version of the animation here. The problem is that it's still saving the same file over and over again. Uh, this is something that we don't want. We want to have a sequence. So instead um, of having a constant file name, we need to create a new file name uh, that also contains the frame number. Um, for if you want to join um, uh, strings, there is a component called concat uh, concatenate. You cannot just add them. So it's concat, concatenate. So we know it, it the name should start with SQ and then um, it should follow um, with the number of the frame, which is we can use the counter from the, from the Anemone to, to, to give the files uh, consecutive names. And now you see that this is SQ100. 
um, this is the file name. Um, and when I run this again, you will see that the folder will start containing, um, yeah, you see it's, it's saving more and more and more files. And when I open it, um, it's empty and I don't know why, because it wasn't before. Oh yeah, I know. Mm. The reason is that the polylines now are in a data tree and, and that's uh, um, messing up this part. Uh, when, uh, when I merge the instructions, they don't merge in one branch. Uh, so, so it doesn't happen that it first draws all the curves and then saves them because, because this, is, uh, this looks different. So I flatten here. To, to put the polylines all into one uh, flat list. And now there is uh, an instruction to draw uh, 21 lines and the, um, or 20 lines and the 21st instruction is to save. So I will restart again. It will resave the files for me and uh, like this. And let's see if it actually works. Yes, it's already um, drawing these. And uh, if, if you look, it's actually uh, saving the animation like this. So I can, uh, this is something that we don't need anymore. This is the first frame of the animation and you can like see that it's animating and you can connect this um, in any software that you want. I use Blender for videos, uh, but you can use also FFmpeg um, just from a command line. Uh, to connect these. I will do one more thing because I really hate the red color. Um, I, I will change the colors uh, so that each one of these 20 has a different color. I will use uh, gradient um, like this. Then I will use um, a series. So I want each of the lines to, to have a different color. I will set this gradient. And when I just have a list of um, geometry and I want each piece to be uh, a different color, I will um, create um, just, uh, just like um, a single purpose series uh, with numbers, with as many numbers as I have the geometry. So uh, I, I made a series from zero to 19. Now I've got 20 numbers and this is sampling, uh, the gradient is sampling uh, the, the color gradient according to uh, certain numbers. So now it's sampling in, in position zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And we need to set the scale of this to, to be actually the same, uh, uh, the, to, the maximum to be 20 and the minimum to be zero. Uh, the zero is by default. The maximum I will add here. Uh, so, so I know whatever number uh, of, of lines do I have, uh, that's the maximum. And as a result, I will have samples, 20 samples of this um, color uh, gradient. And that could be the color that I use for drawing the lines. And you see now that each of the lines has a different color uh, and that's what I like. And I will just execute again like this. And now I should have a sequence. I keep closing the, the folder <laughs> and I need to open it over and over again. So um, now when I, when I open it here like this and it doesn't work, uh, let me see why. I don't know why, but it's probably again uh, because of some uh, squid outline, but it looks okay here. So, ah, let's, yeah. Okay. Uh, as I told you, um, there are some problems. Uh, well, actually, this is not a problem with a, with a plugin. Uh, the thing is that uh, the grasshopper, whenever it can graft, whenever it can possibly generate a data tree, it does. So uh, that's why uh, it also happened here. Uh, this component grafted unnecessarily. So I had to flatten here to actually get a flat list where first squid is drawing something and then saving. I will double click here to, to execute it again. And hopefully uh, now it will uh, save the files properly. Mm, yeah, it seems so. So it's drawing the, the flock like this. 
and it's a 2D PNG file, a sequence of files, and you can uh, connect them. Uh, as I said, in FFmpeg, uh, it's easy, and also in Blender, and you can make um, an animation video out of that. All right, so <clears throat> I will finish this session here. Um, mainly, I, I wanted to show you how can you, um, what plugins are meaningful to, to be used, and when I prefer not using any plugins. Um, I ended up using the plugins, even the one that I um, didn't recommend you to use, uh, the one that I made. Um, but anyway, uh, I didn't have enough time to, to start over uh, with the new version.